I'd like to thank the witnesses for their attendance at today's hearing. I'd also like to highlight two empty chairs today, which I say for two invited witnesses who apparently don't share your commitment to discussing these issues. One chair is for TikTok. Parents, if you don't know what TikTok is, you should. It's a Chinese-owned social media platform so popular among teens that Mark Zuckerberg is reportedly spooked. For Facebook, the fear is lost social media market share. For the rest of us, the fear is somewhat different. A company compromised by the Chinese Communist Party knows where your children are, knows what they look like, what their voices sound like, what they're watching, and what they share with each other. TikTok claims they don't store American user data in China. That's nice, but all it takes is one knock on the door of their parent company, based in China, from a Communist Party official for that data to be transferred to the Chinese government's hands whenever they need it. TikTok claims they don't take direction from China. They claim they don't censor. In fact, in a letter submitted just today to this committee, TikTok said this, no governments, foreign or domestic, direct how we moderate TikTok content. TikTok does not remove content based on sensitivities related to China or other countries. We have never been asked by the Chinese government to remove any content, and we would not do so if asked. That's what they say, and without objection, I'll enter the whole letter into the record. But that's not what former employees of TikTok say. Today, the Washington Post is reporting that TikTok's Chinese parent company imposed strict rules on what could appear on the app in keeping with China's restrictive view of acceptable speech. Former employees said company officials based in Beijing had the final call on whether flagged videos were approved. The former employees said their attempts to persuade Chinese teams not to block or penalize certain videos were routinely ignored out of caution about the Chinese government's restrictions. One former ByteDance manager, that's TikTok's parent company, ByteDance, said this. They want to be a global company, TikTok, and numbers-wise, they've had that success. But the purse is still in China. The money always comes from there, and the decisions all come from there. That's sure a different story than the one TikTok has told this committee in this letter, and that's a problem. TikTok should answer for these discrepancies. They should answer to the millions of Americans who use their product with no idea of its risks. They should have been here today, but after this letter to this committee, they must now appear under oath to tell the truth about their company and its ambitions and what they're doing with our data. The threat isn't just to children's privacy. It's a threat to our national security. We don't know what China can do with this kind of social data in aggregate, what it tells China about our society. They can see who we talk to, what we talk about, where we congregate, what we capture on video. Not all of TikTok's users are just kids. Some work in government or for the military. Others are celebrities or work for major American companies in positions of influence. What does it mean for China? to have a window into such users' social lives. Why would we leave that window open? The other empty chair belongs to a company that has helped open China's window on American consumers, Apple. We're accustomed in hearings like this one to hearing about Apple as a good corporate citizen. It encrypts its messages. It limits its own data collection from users and gives them privacy controls, but Apple's business model and business practices are increasingly entangled with China, a fact that they would rather we not think too much about. China is essential to Apple's bottom line, both on the supply and the demand sides of their business. Apple's investments in Chinese production have helped build the scientific and manufacturing capacity of America's greatest geopolitical rival. But Chinese demand is even more critical to Apple's future. And to service that demand, Apple is risking compromise with authoritarianism. The company hosts its Chinese users' iCloud data in China as part of a joint venture with a Chinese government-controlled entity, GCBD. Apple frequently talks about encryption, but where are those encryption keys for the data stored? China, 
Apple says it has control of those keys, but who knows what that means, and Apple isn't here to tell us. If you've got family in China or business contacts there, you cannot count on iMessage encryption to keep your interactions secure from Chinese authorities. And if you're a Uyghur or a Chinese dissident or a protester in Hong Kong, Apple's corporate values won't do much to protect you. In the midst of the Hong Kong democracy protests, now in their 22nd week, Apple pulled an app from its store that helped protesters and citizens stay safe during violent police crackdowns. Why? Because Beijing pushed for it. Just a few days later, Tim Cook was appointed to chair the board of Xinhua University's business school. If you're an American user of an iOS, you can't be confident that the Chinese government isn't reverse engineering the platform through their privileged access to it via their joint venture with Apple. With Apple and TikTok, we see two sides of the same coin when it comes to data security. The danger of Chinese tech platforms entry into the US market and the danger of American tech companies operations in China. That's one of the most important subjects we can discuss at today's hearing. How does the tech industry's entanglement with China imperil our data security? I look forward to the witness's testimony. Thank you for being here. And now, Senator Whitehouse. Thank you, Chairman. I welcome uh, all of the witnesses who are here. Um, I have a fairly long history with this issue in the Senate, and I can remember when the Senate had pretty much close to zero interest in uh, privacy and data so long as the data was held in private sector hands. We would get quite animated about any data that our national security apparatus might have access to, um, when by contrast, private platforms had more data on Americans than the most intrusive governments in the history of humankind, and we paid virtually no attention to it. I'm delighted that that wall has come down and that we now see the risks from the huge aggregations of private data in private hands as uh, significant. So I'm delighted that this is a topic. Um, I've also been involved in a lot of the efforts for cyber legislation. At one point, we made a lot of progress on a bipartisan bill focusing on critical infrastructure. Um, my Republican coordinates were Senator Kyle, who was then the number two on the Republican side, Senator McCain, who was uh, then uh, chairman on um, armed services. So. It was a pretty high-level operation. We made a lot of progress. We had a considerable number of uh, conversations in the SCIF where there wasn't a whole lot of news and noise to be made, but a lot of good, hard, sincere work with people from the private sector and from our uh, defense and intelligence agencies. And when push finally came to shove, um, the Republican leader went to the floor and said, no cyber bills coming without repeal Obamacare attached to it. So. That ended that effort. Um, then, along with Chairman McCall, I was the co-chair of the CSIS report for the incoming president, which is a very helpful and thoughtful bipartisan cyber analysis. Um, and when President Trump came in, I looked at Tom Bossert, who I think is a very well-versed, honorable professional in the cyberspace, a great technician. And I looked at an attorney general who'd come out of the Senate and a DNI who'd come out of the Senate, and I thought, great, we've got a great opportunity here between the substantive knowledge of Abbasert and the uh, political savvy in the Senate of uh, Sessions and Coates to get a real bill going. And of course, as you know, all of that has fallen apart. None of them work for the administration any longer, and I honestly couldn't tell you who I should go talk to in the administration about cyber legislation, so low is their apparent level of interest. So um, I hope that we're finally in a good space to start doing some real work here. Um, in closing up, I have remarks, and I'd like unanimous consent to put them into the record. In closing, I want to make a uh, procedural point here. Um, in the committees, particularly in the Judiciary Committee, we ordinarily operate one of two ways. We either say this is going to be a bipartisan hearing and we work together and we agree on all the witnesses, there, it's a consensus panels, and the shape of the hearing is agreed to uh, beforehand, 
or you don't go that way, you do a partisan way, and there's a kind of informal rule that you know, one side gets so many witnesses, the other side gets the opposite, and if the minority doesn't think that its views are being fairly expressed uh, by the majority witnesses, they can call witnesses of their own, and you get a divided panel, but they're often very interesting. This is a bit of a hybrid. Until last week, we had bipartisan agreement on two panels, um, and all of that changed rather rapidly. Um, I'm not going to get too excited about all of this um, because the chairman has expressed an interest in trying to make sure that the administration witnesses who we had scheduled will be rescheduled, and I hope that uh, is true. And uh, the panel that actually is here is a panel that was agreed to uh, in bipartisan fashion. But I do believe that if we're going to be doing these bipartisan hearings, then we should see that through all the way through the hearing and not follow the bipartisan path down until the week before and then change to having um, sudden unexpected changes made. So I just want to flag that, Mr. Chairman, because I think you and I have done good work and good hearings before, and I want to make sure that our ground rules as chair and ranking member for these hearings um, are clear with each other. Um, I am delighted to go forward with this hearing. I appreciate your leadership in this area, and I just want to be very cautious about the hybrid were a bipartisan hearing until at the last minute were not a way of doing business. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Whitehouse, and thank you for your long work on this issue. And uh, the Senator's alluding to uh, the uh, common goal we both share, which is to have government, or as, the, as the Senator Whitehouse put it, administration officials come and testify to this committee. And uh, that is uh, a goal that I share and that uh, I look forward to doing with Senator Whitehouse, and, and we hope for their uh, full cooperation. Uh, now let me turn to uh, introduce the witnesses. Mr. Tom Bird is Corporate Vice President of Customer Security and Trust at Microsoft. There he leads engineers, lawyers, policy advocates, project managers, business professionals, data analysts, and cybercrime investigators to manage company cybersecurity. Mr. Bird joined Microsoft in 1995 and has held several leadership roles in the Corporate External and Legal Affairs Department. Mr. Will Carter is Deputy Director of the Technology Policy Program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. His research focuses on international cyber and technology policy issues, including artificial intelligence, surveillance and privacy, data localization, cyber conflict and deterrence, financial sector cybersecurity, and law enforcement and technology, including encryption. Ms. Kara Frederick is a fellow at the Technology and National Security Program at the Center for a New American Security, CNAS. Before joining CNAS, Ms. Frederick helped create and lead Facebook's Global Security Counterterrorism Analysis Program. She was also the team lead for Facebook Headquarters Regional Intelligence Team in Menlo Park, California. Prior to Facebook, she served as a senior intelligence analyst for a U.S. Naval Special Warfare Command and spent six years as a counterterrorism analyst at the Department of Defense. Mr. Klon Kitchen is a Senior Technology Research Fellow at the Heritage Foundation. As Heritage's first Senior Fellow for Technology, National Security, and Science Policy, his research focuses on the intersection of technology and national security, with particular interest in artificial intelligence, autonomous weapon systems, space, and intelligence issues. Prior to joining Heritage, Mr. Kitchen was National Security Advisor to Senator Ben Sass. Thank you all for being here. I will, uh, in keeping with the tradition of the committee, swear you in uh, before we begin testimony. So if you would uh, rise and uh, raise your right arm, hand. You repeat after me, do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give the committee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. Thank you. All right, and now we'll hear uh, your opening uh, statements. Uh, Mr. Burt, we'll start with you. Chairman Hawley, Ranking Member Whitehouse, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. In my comments, I'll focus on the work that Microsoft does to combat criminal and nation state cyber attacks. And I'll discuss why government and the private sector must work together in new ways to combat these attacks. The frequency and success of cybercrime exploits continues to grow. It's estimated that the global financial impact last year was a trillion dollars. And nation state attacks continue to increase in number, sophistication, and impact. For more than a decade, Microsoft has fought back. But we've learned that we best protect our customers when we work collaboratively with government and others in the private sector. Government has law enforcement and intelligence resources that the private sector cannot match. But the private sector has access to data and technological resources that governments cannot match. 
So we must work collaboratively to find innovative solutions. Today, Microsoft's Digital Crimes Unit, truly unique in the private sector, combats business email compromise crime and continues to lead the world in our efforts to shut down criminal botnets. Working closely with law enforcement and private sector partners, we've now taken down 17 botnets, rescuing close to 500 million devices from these criminal networks. Law enforcement faces unique challenges in combating these borderless crimes. That's why we were strong supporters of the Cloud Act, which modernized how cross-border data can be accessed appropriately by law enforcement. We applaud the agreement recently announced between the United States and the United Kingdom implementing the Cloud Act, and we encourage the Department of Justice to continue their efforts to negotiate and conclude additional Cloud Act agreements. Despite our past success, we have not seen law enforcement partner with us on recent botnet takedowns. We're concerned that the reward and recognition structures in our law enforcement agencies do not today provide the incentives to devote more and stronger resources to activities that protect victims but do not yield arrests and convictions. We hope that Congress will provide new incentives for law enforcement to prioritize the disruption and dismantling of criminal networks. In addition, we see increasing nation state attacks causing significant harm to citizens and enterprises around the world. We've used the botnet disruption techniques that we pioneered to disrupt these nation state malign actors who are intent on destroying democracy. We've disrupted groups operating from Russia, China, China Iran, and North Korea, and we will continue to do this important work. Disruption is important but so is improving cybersecurity hygiene. Unpatched systems are exploited by our adversaries, so we strongly promote the prompt installation of security updates. We advocate for use of multi-factor multi authentication, and we develop cutting-edge AI security services like Microsoft Defender ATP and Azure Sentinel. We can combat and we can defend but we also need to reduce how many attacks are launched against our civilians and enterprises. Long-term solutions for protecting cyberspace require clear and binding international commitments that define acceptable online nation state behavior. This problem cannot be solved by governments or the private sector acting alone. Multi-stakeholder solutions are essential to combat what is necessarily a multi-stakeholder problem. That's why last year, Microsoft was proud to join in supporting the Paris Call for Trust and Security in Cyberspace, a voluntary commitment to nine foundational cybersecurity principles, including protecting from cyber attack, critical infrastructure, elections, the public core of the internet, and intellectual property. The Paris Call has been endorsed by more than 65 governments and over 500 enterprises and organizations. Unfortunately, the United States has not yet endorsed the Paris Call. For the sake of the security of American citizens, those around the world endangered by escalating and sophisticated attacks online, Microsoft continues to encourage the United States to join this landmark, multi-stakeholder commitment. The private sector and government must work together to invent 21st century solutions to these uniquely 21st century threats. Microsoft stands ready to do our part. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Burt. Mr. Carter. Chairman Hawley, Ranking Member Whitehouse, distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to participate in today's hearing on this important topic. Threats to private and sensitive data remain one of the most important risks facing our nation. Companies that collect and use data face growing threats from both malicious cyber actors and restrictive government policies. The lack of U.S. leadership on global issues of cybersecurity, data governance, and digital law enforcement has put companies in a difficult position, caught between the need to secure data against both lawful and unlawful abuse and the demands of global governments for access to data. Cyber threats to sensitive data are growing fast. The exponential growth of the attack surface as more of our lives move online and connected devices proliferate has created new vulnerabilities that can be exploited by malicious actors. Offensive cyber capabilities have become a must-have in the arsenals of even small national governments, and a thriving gray market in offensive cyber capabilities has grown up to feed that need. 
Both the Obama and Trump administrations have repeatedly demonstrated a lack of resolve to impose meaningful consequences on nation states that violate norms of state behavior and engage in cyber attacks against the US. Cybercrime has also become an epidemic. In 2018, CSIS estimated that cybercrime cost the global economy more than $600 billion, nearly 1% of GDP, up 35% from 2014. And malicious cyber activity is largely, largely consequence free. Only 0.3% of reported cyber attacks in the United States result in an arrest. And cybercrime is a massively underreported crime. Cyber attacks are just one of many threats to private and sensitive data. In many ways, the more troublesome challenge for US companies is the growth of lawful exploitation of technology and data by governments. Countries wish to enforce their laws and protect their citizens as they define both of these goals and expect companies that do business in their countries to enable them to do so. But problems arise for companies when countries lack appropriate governance mechanisms to prevent abuse of that data, when cultural differences lead to clashes between the values of Western technology platforms and the global populations they serve, and when governments intentionally utilize commercially available technologies for malicious surveillance, repression, and exclusion. US companies and the US government have developed a range of technologies and policies to combat these challenges. Companies utilize technical solutions like unrecoverable encryption and ephemerality to render their data inaccessible to governments, even with a legal order. The US government has also helped companies to protect data, for example, through the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, which prevents US companies from disclosing the content of communications stored in the United States to a foreign government unless that government submits a mutual legal assistance request through the US government. But this approach has significant costs and trade-offs. Implementing technical solutions that prevent companies from disclosing data to governments in order to prevent abuse is great, except that it can also prevent companies from providing data that could prevent serious crimes and terrorism. The rollout of end-to-end -end encryption on Facebook Messenger, for example, will render many of the tools currently used to combat child pornography on Messenger ineffective, requiring new strategies to combat child porn. And policies like data localization, encryption mandates, and data retention requirements that companies are pursuing to preserve their access to data can lead to worse security outcomes for everyone. When governments are unable to access data through lawful means, many of them also turn to cyber attacks to fill those gaps. The US government must play a leading role in addressing the many threats to data security, both lawful and unlawful, around the world. As Senator Whitehouse mentioned, in 2015, he chaired a cyber policy task force for the 45th president to strengthen cybersecurity for the United States. Its key recommendations remain relevant today. Incentivizing and where necessary regulating the adoption of basic cybersecurity practices and cyber hygiene, increasing penalties and liability for companies that fail to protect data or sell insecure products, and addressing resource gaps through support for fundamental research and workforce development can help to advance cybersecurity around the world. Creating serious consequences for malicious actors is also essential. We must empower law enforcement to co effectively combat cybercrime, and we must demonstrate the political will to consistently impose penalties on nation states that engage in malicious cyber activity, even when it puts a strain on complex security and economic relationships. The US government must also take the lead in developing a functional and sustainable data governance framework for the world. Last year, we produced a report called Low-Hanging Fruit, Evidence-Based Solutions to the Digital Evidence Challenge, which outlined a series of recommendations to streamline cooperation between companies and governments and facilitate lawful and appropriate access to data. Making it easier for governments to access and utilize data that is available in appropriate circumstances and with appropriate safeguards can help reduce the pressure to pursue harmful policies like data localization, encryption mandates, data retention requirements, and government hacking, and put the spotlight on companies that intentionally exploit data to monitor, marginalize, exclude, and oppress their citizens. I thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Carter. Ms. Frederick. There we go. Distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I am here because the growing contest between free, open societies and closed, repressive regimes is playing out on the digital front, and our data will make all the difference. When I worked at a big five tech firm in Silicon Valley, the saying went that we can do more in one day than others can accomplish in a week. Much of that outsized impact was a result of the volume and variety of data at our fingertips and what we could do with it. My experience with digital intelligence collection and analysis as a member of the US intelligence community similarly impressed upon me the great advantage of data security, but also what can happen when data vulnerabilities are exploited. Many talented people are working in America to get all of this right, 
and it is imperative that we do so. The context of our work is before us. Technology is being repurposed abroad to undercut its original liberalizing potential. The Chinese government uses digital systems to enable pervasive surveillance and exacerbate gross human rights abuses by targeting and persecuting Uyghurs within Xinjiang and throughout China. The consequences of these abuses do not stop in mainland China. Beyond China's borders, countries are adopting Chinese technology to strengthen their own brand of technical illiberalism. Further, authoritarian regimes continue to attack democracies with the tools created by free societies. Russia is invigorating its campaign of cyber hacking and information attacks against the United States and Europe. Iran is following suit. North Korea's efforts have not yet abated. And even as these tactics spread around the globe, the technology behind them is evolving, enabling even more sophisticated assaults. Synthetic media, realistic bots, machine language models with the potential to generate false information at scale and automated spear phishing are a foretaste of the more difficult challenges to come. Yet the United States' system of checks and balances is a bulwark against the perverse use of this technology within our own borders. Properly applied, our democratic system offers a set of institutions and practices to act as guardrails on our internal use of these technologies, but relying on this system is no longer enough. Americans are confronting deep systemic risk when using platforms operating in and owned by companies in countries with a history of cyber espionage and forced tech transfer. Private Chinese technology companies' ability to resist their government is highly circumscribed at best, due, in part, to a series of national laws and standards that are broadly written and ultimately compel these companies, like TikTok's parent, ByteDance, to comply with government requests for data. Russia also has a data localization requirement, and a similar scenario is likely to play out in other regimes. Further, we should explore the implications of combining and correlating massive data sets for populations around the globe. China already has a precedent of synchronizing biometric and behavioral data for political and social control. Their integrated joint operations platform and their much discussed social credit system are evidence of this. China is also exporting its values embedded in the technology itself to the world. It is unclear whether TikTok continues its censorship practices under the guise of content moderation after it updated its privacy policy in February of 2019. Still, Instead of importing the values of censorship and control to the US, we should be exporting our values of openness and transparency to them. This is all occurring against the backdrop of a digital environment growing more complex. For instance, technical signatures are becoming less conclusive when it comes to attribution, as we saw when Russia hijacked an Iranian cyber espionage operation last month. This makes it that much more difficult to combat their attacks against our own systems and respond accordingly. Solutions are overdue. If democratic societies do not establish the rules of the road for our data security and privacy protections, authoritarians will do it for us. Congress should mandate interagency import reviews of information and communications technology against a criteria that encompasses the likelihood of systemic risk. Lawmakers should enshrine data protections, especially for sensitive biometric data, and incentivize transparency within the government and the private sector for private companies play a critical role. Their sustained and unfettered access to a high volume and variety of personal data with high commercial value gives them inordinate control. American tech companies should therefore adopt a set of rules, norms, and guiding principles for the use of their technology globally and for interfacing with authoritarian regimes that will not tip the scale in favor of repression. American private companies should treat U.S. national security as their own strategic imperative. Thank you, and I look forward to your question. Thank you, Ms. Frederick. Mr. Kitchen. Thank you, Chairman Hawley, Ranking Member Whitehouse, and the members of the subcommittee <clears throat> for the opportunity to testify before you. When I was in the United States intelligence community, our mission was to collect, to understand, to predict, and to shape human behavior and events. Those in government call this intelligence. Technology companies call this market research, data analysis, audience segmentation, or service provisioning. But in reality, in the age of the so-called knowledge of economy, we're all in the intelligence business now. The proliferation of sensors, the deluge of digitized data, 
and the exponential growth in computational capacity are combining to produce a previously unimagined possibility for human thriving and happiness. But these positive outcomes are not the only thing that is being created. General cybersecurity risks are now combining with increasingly aggressive, hostile foreign actors to create an environment that few understand and that even fewer are prepared for. China is a central concern in this regard. For decades, countries like China and Russia have pursued a deliberate strategy of using their foreign policy and intelligence communities to copy and to steal American technologies. These strategies are starting to produce meaningful results, with several foreign tech companies now legitimately rivaling U.S. tech leaders in both innovation and market capitalization. If left unaddressed, this could pose a challenge not only to our economic security, but also our greater national security. In January 2020, for example, a new Chinese cybersecurity law will go into effect and companies operating in the country will have no place left to hide. The new law is part of Beijing's years-long effort to expand its domestic surveillance programs and is rooted in a massive cybersecurity overhaul adopted in 2016. Next year, all companies, including foreign-owned companies, must arrange and manage their computer networks so that the Chinese government has access to every bit and byte of data that is stored on, transits over, or in any other way touches Chinese information infrastructure. Put simply, the Chinese government will have lawful and technical access to all digital data within its borders and perhaps to large volumes of data beyond those borders. Companies have long known that their intellectual property, or IP, their trade secrets, and even their communications are highly sought by their market competitors in Asia and by the Chinese government particularly. Many of these risks are simply accepted as the price of doing business in China. And those risks that are deemed unacceptable are mitigated by security technologies and networking strategies that attempt to hide critical information from prying eyes. All of these technologies and strategies under the new law will be illegal. For example, it is currently commonplace for companies operating in China to set up virtual private networks, or VPNs, on which their data and communication is stored and sent within an encrypted pipe that outsiders cannot crack or intercept. These VPNs and the underlying encryption, to the degree that they prevent access by the Chinese government, will no longer be allowed. There will be no truly private or encrypted messaging in China, no confidential data, no trade secrets, no exemptions. If a company operates in China, it will be required to operate in such a way as to provide the country's intelligence and law enforcement authorities unfettered digital access. The days of paying the IP tax for access to the world's fastest growing market are over. This access will now cost you everything. And this is precisely the Chinese plan. To put it simply, our long-term economic and national security must account for and roll back a sustained campaign of cyber-enabled economic warfare, the likes of which will take a giant leap forward in just two months. I have provided amplifying information in my submitted testimony, and I'm happy to answer your questions to the best of my abilities. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kitchener. Thanks to, to all of the witnesses. Um, I'd like to start with TikTok, if we could, and, and what they're doing with all of the data that they are collecting from American users. And for one thing, I want to get it on the record that TikTok is collecting a lot of data. I mean, a lot. In terms of its terms of service state, I'm going to quote now, that it collects contact details, content you create, and your location. It collects, I'm still quoting, from third-party social network providers and technical and behavioral information about your use of the platform. And it collects information contained in the messages you send through the TikTok platform and information from your phone book. That's a lot of data. It's pretty comparable to what the massive data harvesting machines like Facebook and Google are scooping up. Now, TikTok says that they store American user data 
either here or in Singapore, not in China. But Ms. Frederick, let me just address this question to you. That doesn't necessarily mean the fact that, that TikTok allegedly stores the data here or in Singapore, that doesn't necessarily mean that Beijing can't get to it. Is, is that right? So I think the greater question here is the fact that the laws that apply to the parent company, ByteDance. Uh, so that is essentially the problem. There is a parallel app uh, in China, uh, which TikTok, ever since the CFIUS investigation came to light, has uh, potentially made some moves to sort of extricate uh, their, their dealings with you know, what actually goes on in China and to do so explicitly. Um, the Douyin app, which is the one in China, is basically like the parallel version of TikTok, but existing in China. So they've attempted to sort of shield themselves by saying, hey, everything in that people use on TikTok is US or you know, Western friendly nation based and stored in the US and that kind of thing. But ByteDance, the, the 2017 acquisition of Musical.ly is what is being investigated in CFIUS right now. That is the problem. That is something we need to think about. The, the law that Klon discussed uh, would apply to TikTok's parent company, ByteDance in China. So ByteDance is, just to get the facts clear on this, ByteDance is the parent company of TikTok. ByteDance is located in China. It's a Chinese-based company. They are subject uh, to the laws, Mr. Kitchen, that you were talking about, including the 2017 National Intelligence Law, which requires Chinese organizations and companies to cooperate with state intelligence work. That's the designation in the law. Is that right, Mr. Kitchen? Uh, that's correct, sir. As, as a Chinese company, the, the parent company, who is bound by Chinese law, it's completely reasonable to assume that any individual's information, including the information of American users on that service, can be har harvested and exploited. And just one other point, technically this must be true. A lot of the development of this application is done in China still, even if it has an American uh, kind of front company or operating company. And so they have to be able to push updates from Chinese development into the US market if they want to have an updated, increasingly capable technology. And so the idea that they can somehow meaningfully, technically kind of warden off this information from China doesn't make sense operationally. I think that's a really important point. So, so much of the app is, is developed, much of the content, much of the, what's used in the app is developed in China, is pushed to uh, users here in the United States. The parent company is a China-based company. They're subject to these uh, restrictions, or frankly, they're subject to having their doors opened at any time by the, communist, uh, the Chinese Communist Party under China's law. And uh, as uh, Alex Stamos puts it, uh, in today's Washington Post article, the leverage of the government, meaning the Chinese government, that it has over the people who has access to the data, that's what's relevant. Do you agree with that, Mr. Kitchen? In other words, the, the ability of Beijing to go to ByteDance, the parent company, and say, you are required under Chinese law to give us access to all of this data, it means that ByteDance could at any point scoop up American users' data and make that available to Beijing. Is that, is that fair to say? That's without a doubt true. Let me talk about some of the ways that TikTok uh, or other Chinese companies could abuse this kind of data. Mr. Kitchen, am I right in thinking that autonomous weapon systems rely on artificial intelligence so that they're able to uh, interpret and identify images? Is that correct? That's true. So if China obtains images of, say, our servicemen and women, either through social media or something like the OPM attack, uh, could that have relevance to how they train their, their AI and their autonomous uh, weapons? Uh, absolutely. In fact, one of the um, criticisms of some of the image recognition that China has uh, developed up until this point is that it was xenocentric, that perhaps they weren't able to uh, operate in Western environments as well as they might. This would be a way of addressing that delinquency. Because of the sheer amount of data and, frankly, imagery that they will get of Western users. Is that what you're saying, Mr. Kitchen? Yes, sir. This will be my final question for you. How can we ensure that TikTok or other, other Chinese tech companies aren't Trojan horses that are gathering data on Americans and then sending that information back to China to be collected and gathered and, and used for the Beijing government's purposes? So you're asking me how we can ensure that. I'm not sure we can. Um, the law that I described simply requires access. And anyone who thinks that a Chinese company, even if they have an American you know, portion of their company, can look at the government in Beijing and tell them no, that's a fundamental misunderstanding of how the government in Beijing works. Thank you very much. Senator Whitehouse. Thank you, Chairman. Um, one of the things that I've been pushing for is for kind of a stress test of the NIST framework to see how good it is at um, actually performing its uh, assigned task of providing 
critical infrastructure cybersecurity. I'm reading here, a recent survey of 1,500 business leaders by Microsoft and Marsh found that only 37% of firms believe that soft industry standards like the NIST framework are very effective at preventing cyber attacks. The same survey found that 19% of firms had, quote, no confidence that they could prevent cyber threats, and 22% had no confidence they could respond to cyber events. Mr. Burt, is it time to stress test the NIST framework? Um, Senator, I think that two things about that survey, which is one that was uh, performed by um, Marsh in collaboration with Microsoft. First, one of the things that we saw, which we think is a positive development, is that between 2017 when we did it the first time and then the most recent survey, we've seen that the number of people in these enterprises that were surveyed that are aware of the risks that they face and the need to take steps has increased significantly. And that's a good thing. But is it enough? It's, it's not enough. More needs to be done, absolutely. The NIST framework, we believe, we actually were one of the contributors to the NIST framework, um, working with NIST on that. And we believe that the NIST framework is actually a very useful yeah. um, framework for right. companies Beats to assess. Beats having nothing before. Yep, and, and companies should be assessing their cybersecurity maturity. We do. It's one of the things that we regularly assess our cybersecurity maturity as a company relative to the NIST framework. And I know from discussions with others around industry in general that increasingly companies are adopting it and using it. I would Thank say you. one thing, though, that's important here. Okay, is, but be quick because my time is short. I'm sorry. It's very complex. The NIST framework is complicated, and if you don't have a, a big IT staff, it can be hard to implement. Correct. And that's why we've built built together with others in, in uh, industry, we've built simpler tools for small and medium-sized businesses to apply a simpler version of the NIST framework. But Mr. we need Car more attention Thank you. paid. Mr. Carter, between um, the desire of the private sector not to suffer reputational harm when they've been hit by a cyber attack and the uh, overclassification that the federal government indulges in, how complete do you think the picture is that the American public gets of the extent to which uh, our country and our companies are under cyber attack? I think the picture is very incomplete, uh, partly because there are a lot of disincentives to accurate reporting uh, by companies, partly because there are no clear mechanisms for consolidation of that reporting, partly because many types of attacks aren't obvious to their victims, uh, and partly because in many cases, the information that is shared is anonymized to the point that it's largely useless for understanding the threat environment that we face. Um, back to you, Mr. Burt. You guys were the uh, leaders in botnet takedowns. I was fighting to get the Department of Justice to do more on botnets back then when your first complaint was filed. And I was telling uh, Chairman Hawley, we're both f recovering lawyers. Um, what a joy it was to read that complaint, A, because it existed, and B, because when you got to count, I don't know, six or something like that, there was a count of trespass to chattels, which is a doctrine from the medieval English common law that I probably slept through in my foundations of property law class. But clearly, um, Microsoft has been a leader in fighting botnets for a long time. What more could the Department of Justice be doing now to continue the process of constant weed cutting that needs to uh, take place to strip. First, is there any good use for a botnet? Or is it a weed? And second, what more should we be doing to weed whack them? Almost all botnets are weeds, um, Senator Whitehouse. There are some for research purposes and others, but those can be identified. In our view, almost all botnets that meet that standard are, are weeds and need to be eradicated. There's two things that we would like to do with the Department of Justice and law enforcement to improve in this area. One is we need more strategic coordination. And when I meet with leaders across law enforcement and the intelligence community, DHS here, we always talk about public-private partnership, but we aren't doing enough to realize that. And this is an area where we're committed, and we know that if we could meet strategically to identify what are the key botnets, the most impactful, the most serious ones, how can we join together and in collaborative way do something about that? That would be step one. Step two is... A botnet in a nutshell is a force multiplier for some evildoer. It's an evildoer who has managed to infect thousands or millions of computers with their malware. And, and can, can deploy those computers. 
And they, yep, and they can coordinate uh, cybercrime across all those computers without their victims even knowing that their, their computers have been infected. Um, and the second thing we need is for the Department of Justice and FBI to have the right incentives and the right um, priorities paid to reducing botnets, to attack botnets, even, because, even when they can't necessarily get handcuffs on the perpetrators because they're living in countries with no extradition or the other challenges that we face in this space. Just disrupting the botnets alone and stopping those criminal enterprises is in itself an important thing to do. And finally, if I may go on Absolutely. a moment, um, I've been arguing for quite some time that we should pursue a coalition of the willing to create international cybersecurity norms I think the Obama administration made a mistake trying to bring the Russians and the Chinese into a productive discussion on this subject. It's a little bit like trying to bring a couple of burglars into a productive discussion on home security. Forget them. Um, I would consider that it would be wise for us to, as a nation, try to set norms with countries that share our values in a secure and safe internet. And to that end, I'm wondering if you believe that the cybersecurity tech accord that the private sector entered into, and the Cyber Peace Institute that the private sector has also stood up, um, eliminate that need, or whether this is a pursuit that government should still engage in? It's absolutely a pursuit government should still engage in, Senator Whitehouse. The Cybersecurity Tech Accord is a group that Microsoft initially set up, but now we have over 120 companies from around the globe who work together to endorse key principles of cybersecurity for their customers, but also to articulate the view of the tech community on key issues about cybersecurity policy and appropriate norms. The Cyber Peace Institute is a newly established nonprofit to be based in Geneva that is going to do work that is not happening elsewhere in government or the private sector to really bring transparency to the impact and uh, of, of nation state cyber attacks. The harm, the human harm that these nation state cyber attacks cause and to work to increase resiliency around the world to these attacks. Those are both important, but what you said is absolutely right. The United States must join with other like-minded countries to establish enforceable norms of nation state behavior. And if that means we can isolate those countries that refuse to abide by those rules, so much the better. At least we will have that isolation clear. But we need the United States to play a stronger diplomatic role. There's two pending United Nations efforts underway, one that was initially sponsored by the United States, one initially sponsored by Russia. They're, they're working side by side to try to establish norms of conduct for cyberspace. And we are working um, on both of those processes to try to ensure that they are productive and result in useful outcomes. But those are both areas where we need the United States to be actively engaged in pushing for these norms. Maybe even with international sanctions to back up the norms. Mr. Chairman, thank you for letting me uh, go on beyond my time. This is a good hearing. Absolutely. I have just a, a few more questions. Um, Mr. Cl Mr. Kitching, let me come back to you. I, I become increasingly concerned about the willingness of some American companies now. We're talking about TikTok, a Chinese-based company, but American companies to store data and the tools necessary to read that data in China. And I want to think about Apple for a second, which provides cloud services in China. Now, for a long time, Apple stored its encryption keys in the United States. But beginning last year, it moved its encryption keys over to China for the data that's stored there. Uh, let me ask you what I think are some simple questions. Encryption keys, first of all, are what you need to read things like uh, protected emails and text messages. Is that right? Uh, that's correct. So if you have the encryption keys, you can read private communications that are stored in the cloud. Is that have I got that right? Uh, that's correct. Now, Reuters report last year stated that because Apple chose to move its encryption keys to China, and I'm quoting now, Chinese authorities will have far easier access to text messages, email, and other data stored in the cloud. Do you agree with that, and can you talk to us about the implications? Yeah, so I think uh, the short answer is I do agree with that. There is a distinction to be made. The Apple, the action that Apple took was it moved uh, the encryption keys associated with Chinese users of their iCloud capabilities. So it's not all users, it's Chinese. And that's coming in compliance with the Chinese law, as you mentioned, Senator, of data localization. That being said, in your opening statement, you raised a very good point that uh, by having the unfettered access or the, the significant access that they likely enjoy, they will gain greater insight into the inner workings of Apple's iCloud accounts and their broader technological capabilities. 
which could then in uh, allow them to do a great deal more in terms of collecting outside of those borders. So that's a very real concern. Let me, thank you for that. Let me ask you about this. I mean, how does Chinese access to encryption keys for data stored in China by, by uh, Apple's Chinese users, how does that affect an American who sends an email or a text message to family member in China or to friends in China or business contacts in China? It can be captured. And what, in, in other words, it, it could potentially, the, the fact that the, that the keys are stored in China could potentially put the whole sort of communication string at issue, right? I mean, so if you have an American, again, here, sending information to friends, family members, business associates, what have you, that whole iMessage alone, the fact that, well, it's end-to-end -end encrypted, that, that nobody can get to it, that's not necessarily true since the encryption key, the keys are stored in China for China use of data. Is that, is, am I correct about that? That's right. If, if there's essentially any Chinese node within that loop, it potentially compromises the entire network. Let me just ask you this, and you, you alluded to this in your last piece of testimony. Would you trust any sensitive data being stored in China? In other words, would it concern you if your location data, for instance, was stored in China or email data? <clears throat> uh, so as a member of the intelligence community after the OPM hack, I assume they have much of my data. Uh, <clears throat> and I don't like that. Uh, and so, no, uh, I, I don't think that that's okay. I think any person has to make a, a recognition that that is likely the case. And the real change now is that these governments and the technological capabilities themselves are becoming sufficiently big to where that's a real problem. Up until this point, it's been theoretical. Now we're actually developing the computational capability to actually exploit this information in ways that are meaningful to both the Chinese and U.S. Uh, citizens. Would you say that Apple and companies like them are compromising American interests in data security by storing uh, both the data itself in country in China as well as the encryption keys? So if I might, I'll make two points. Um, any company that is complying with China's cybersecurity laws are now making decisions that affect more than their bottom line. These decisions are now risking our own national security. Um, China imprisons and tortures and kills religious minorities and political dissidents, and it's using compliant companies to do this at scale. Um, now, operating according to the laws of a country where you do business is only rational to the degree that those laws are just. But let's remember that there were plenty of people who were just following the law in Nazi Germany, and that does not excuse them from the consequences of their actions. I'm really struck by what you just said, that, that uh, Beijing is using compliant companies to carry out repression at scale. Uh, that is, uh, that I think really sums it up. Anything further, Senator Whitehouse? Um, if I may ask two questions. First, Mr. Kitchen, you mentioned the OPM hack. I think the OPM hack is very significant and highly relevant to the hearing, and so for the sake of the hearing record, could you give a minute on what the OPM hearing hack, the OPM hack was, and um, what it discovered about you? and other uh, government workers? <clears throat> and who did it? Uh, <clears throat> so I'm going to discuss this as it was reported in the news. Correct. Um, it was publicly reported in the news, uh, and it has been identified that the Chinese were uh, responsible for uh, infiltrating and exploiting uh, a number of databases that were held by the Office of Personal Management, essentially the federal government's HR uh, organization. Uh, and they were able to, among other things, exfiltrate um, uh, what's called the, the SF-86 form, which is um, people who worked in the intelligence community and the government, we fill out a 100-page form that gives you everything about ourselves. Uh, they got fingerprints and a whole host of other things. Um, this information, it, it's hard to scope just how that information couldn't be used. Um, in terms of, if you thought about it as a counterintelligence threat, you could look at the individuals who had been processed with those SF-86, how they had been allowed to um, enter into the intelligence community, and if it was your objective to place you know, a spy within that community, well, you would have the ability to determine what is the perfect legend for that person. How do we optimize them so that they can get in with as little difficulty as possible? You now have that information. Uh, if you wanted to simply build a profile on the types of people who were in that community, you could do that. Now, there was some original, um, we made ourselves feel better by saying that certain agencies weren't involved in that information. But again, 
their absence, you can use that to discover who they were by exclusion. So if you're under a State Department uh, cover operating overseas, but you're not in that database. Guess what? They know who you are. Yeah. Uh, so these are just some of the obvious kinds of things. But the broader problem is that this is going into a broader strategy that Chinese are operating. It's called the Thousand Grains of Sand Strategy, where they're just building a mosaic of insight and awareness um, that is a catastrophic national security concern that we have not yet dealt with. And Ms. Frederick, if an American company has access to enormous amounts of personal data of an American, let's say it's a Google or a Facebook, um, and they are trying to monetize that, what are the constraints on them doing business with either a foreign company that fronts for the government or even a foreign government directly and selling as they would to any other customer the information that they offer um, or the service of providing uh, information that they offer? Because sometimes they don't tell the customer the information. They just say, trust us, we'll do it, and we'll hit all the people that you want to hit. What are the restraints on an American corporation doing that with a foreign government or with a front corporation for a foreign government? So the problem here is the restraints are deficient. Uh, there is not enough transparency. Right now, we don't even have granularity into what, of the, what these American companies are necessarily uh, collecting. And I alluded early on to the, the bulwark that sort of prevents abuse, right? The, um, the system that we have in place that uh, is critical to, to make sure that this data by Americans isn't exploited. Facial recognition is topic in this area. Um, the problem is we haven't figured it out yet. And that's what I mean by the rules of the road haven't been set. Uh, the U.S. government doesn't really have that much transparency into the behavioral data, the biometric content, everything that even American companies are sucking up. Um, so that is a problem. I think we, we basically need to work together. Public-private partnerships are, are critical in this way. Um, and we need to draft or help you all draft legislation that puts the proper constraints on this. Uh, that basically says data matters, that there should be value for your data that is, um, you know, propagated throughout the American populace. So I think we basically need to do better in that regard. Mr. Chairman, I think willful blindness seems to be a theme among our platforms. They don't want to ask the questions because they don't want to hear the answers. When um, Facebook is doing something as obvious as selling political advertisements, and accepts payment in rubles, you'd think that somewhere in the genius's apparatus, somebody might have thought, hmm, I'm selling political ads in my home country and the payment is denominated in rubles. What might that mean? But they didn't care to look, they didn't try to look, they didn't want to look, they wanted to cash the rubles and move on. And then when they improved their genius strategy in trying to prevent foreign interference in our elections, they went all the way to making you create a shell corporation. But Facebook doesn't even require that the shell corporation that's buying the political advertisement disclose who's really behind it. So if you were to set up Boris and Natasha LLC as a phony Delaware shell corporation, Facebook would happily sell you political advertising time, even though it would be obvious to an ordinary person that something is up. And this business, as Ms. Frederick said, of trying to figure out how you create the incentive so that willful blindness is no longer a successful business model where the security of the United States is at stake is something worth our attention. I thank you for the hearing. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of the witnesses for being here. We'll stand adjourned.